the barbell investment strategy for retirement. Here it is, my friends. It's going to be awesome. I cannot tell you how much we have to cover here in a short amount of time. There's not really any reason for it to be short, but it's just because it's on my head and I got to get it out, got to get out. The interesting thing about doing this YouTube stuff is I've had spreadsheets of all kinds of different ideas for as far back as I can see. I just said, what if I did this? What if I did that? But I had no place to share it with anybody. It's frustrating. So now I get this YouTube channel and I, it's just as fun for me. It's crazy. And look, I don't have all the answers. I mean, this is just one example. You can do your own spreadsheets and share with me for sure. Um, but at the end of the day, it's just something that I find it was interesting. If I find it interesting, maybe you will too, and you'll get some value out of this. Because for me, I do. All right, so the, the, the synopsis is we have a barbell approach to retirement. We're saying we're going to take a certain amount of money and put it in cash, and cash is being CDs and uh, stocks, all right? So what we're going to do is we're going to start with $500,000 is what we're going to start with. How much will go into stocks? How much will go into cash? And again, in cash, I'm using CDs, essentially a 10-year treasury yield because that's roughly what a CD can give us. You know, look, you can make it, or a Ginnie Mae fund is kind of where the cash would be, in my opinion. But either way. All right, so we're saying essentially we're going to say we're going to have a 6%. We're going to have 25, 30, and 35 a year. 25, 30, and 35 a year. And this is what's going to happen is this is the amount we need. Oops, I just got to go backwards here. This right here is the amount we need on top of Social Security to pay the bills, all right? So well, it doesn't, literally doesn't matter. But for simplicity, we'll say Social Security gives us $25,000 a year, and we need 50. So we're going to have 25000 coming from our portfolio, which is a 5% yield. Or if we need 55, we're going to have 30000 coming from our portfolio with a 6% distribution yield. And if we need uh, 60000 we'll have 35000 coming from our portfolio, which is a 7% distribution yield. All right, then we're going to do one of two things. We're going to have five years or three years of cash. So for the next six episodes, we're just going to have five years of cash. All right, so five years of cash. And then what we're going to do is we're going to have it just a straight increasing grade of uh, uh, consumption model where you're spending 25000 this year, 25000 plus inflation the next, and so on and so on. And then we're going to say, we're also going to do the same thing, except we're going to reduce our spending by 10% in year 10, at the end of year 10. I hope that makes sense. So, all right, let's dive into this. You'll see what I'm talking about. So this is the first one, a barbell investment approach of portfolio for retirement, a 7% distribution yield. So we're here, we're taking $35,000 a year from the portfolio. And what we're going to do is we're going to take five years of cash. So five years of cash is uh, 35,000 times five. It should be uh, 175, 35 times five, and it is. So that's five years of cash. So let me draw you what this looks like here. All right, so this, sometimes it's easier to draw it than just to show you the spreadsheet. 175 and 325, 500,000, boink, boink. Does that make sense? So you got 175,000 in cash. And again, I'm looking, you could look at a Ginnie Mae. It's probably a good way to look at it. And 325 in the S&P 500. All right. So now what you'll see is you have inflation rate in 1963. Oops. Uh, so we're going from 1963 to 2018. All right. Now the problem, well, you're not going to see here because they're going to run out of money. But anyway, 1963 to 2018, we're, we're running these numbers. We have inflation. This is each and every year, the CPI, the average inflation. So I just averaged the inflation for 1963. I averaged it for 1964 and so on and so on. And that's the inflation rate. And then we got to actually, that's 1.3. We got to make it a percentage so we can easier to uh, calculate. So anyway, this is all inflation stuff right here. All right. So now we're using a 10-year treasury annual yield data. The average yield over the course of that year, 1963, it was 4%. So initially you say, wow, the 10-year treasury did much better than inflation rate in 1963. All right. So that's what's happening so far. Now, at the end of the day, um, why am I using a 10-year treasury? Because it's, the, it's, in my opinion, the most important interest rate there is out there, for sure. Uh, it's reflected in intermediate bonds, but CDs can reflect uh, treasuries as well, 10-year treasury. Like right now, a CD can pay, is paying more than a 10-year treasury, for sure. And that was the inverted yield curve, blah, blah, blah. Look, CDs will give you historically roughly this, similar to a uh, 10-year treasury yield. But, I mean, not all the time. I get that. There's always, always, always... You know, you get a different approach to take. But if I like the Ginnie Mae, the Ginnie Mae is always my point, my starting point, which is V F I I X. What I can get in the Ginnie Mae versus what I can get in a CD, they're pretty much they they pretty much correspond. And I'm using that as our yield. 
uh, for the, the amount of money that we have in the bucket of cash. All right, so using the yield on the 10 year treasury, because essentially what I'd advocate is the first year you have nothing but cash, the savings or checking account. Then you got a one year CD, a two year CD, a three year CD, and a four year CD. And I would think on average, you should be able to get roughly a 10 year bond yield. I, you know, look, you can dis dispute that, that's fine. I frankly don't care. But at the end of the day, you got one year in cash, a one year CD, two year CD, three year CD, and a four year CD, right? I hope that makes sense. And we're averaging the interest that you're getting on all those things. Um, there's no, the reason why I don't want to do each and every CD, because man, that's too much work, man. I'm just saying at the end of the day, we're going to historical average yield of a 10 year treasury. You don't like it. That's fine. Yeah. I, I, that's, this is it, the, the issue that all these, a lot, some people get with, all right, your model's wrong, man. The model is always wrong. This will not be right going forward. It doesn't matter. The model is always, there is no back testing that you can say, well, back test it. Well, thus we can freaking hang our hand on it. It just gives you something to think on. If you're going to set and forget it, this is not none of the, you should never set and forget it when it comes to retirement planning. For heaven's sake, I don't care your stupid back testing. We can back test it to a blue in the face. Back testing is not synonymous with what will happen in the future. Anyway, so, but I, I like using the 60s uh, and going to 70s and 80s because we have, a, 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 we have an era of high inflation. We start with low interest rates and low inflation. Then we have a year of high inflation. Then we have a year of higher interest rates and dropping inflation, which is nice. Then we got a booming market, then we got a correcting market, but even the market from the late 60s, to basically up until 82, basically did not much hardly at all relative to the rate of inflation. So it's a wonderful time period to say, hmm, if I was able to survive this time, I think I'm gonna be a good place because of the, the, the volatility of inflation, the volatility of interest rates, the volatility of the market in the early part of it, you know, from, from 73 and 74 got hammered. We had a couple down years in the 60s. It's just a wonderful place to start. If you start, like I said before, 1980s, you're just starting with a, the goose was laying golden eggs and all you're doing is picking them up. All right, so what you can see, we take our $175,000, all right? Now what we're doing is we're gonna take this right here, 175,000, we're subtracting out 35,000 because that's the amount of money we need from the cash bucket in the first year. I hope that makes sense. So that leaves us with $140,000, right? Because we have 175,000 to start with, but we need 35,000 at the beginning of the cycle and we're not getting any interest on that 130 uh, on that 35,000. Now we're going to give an average yield of 4% on this. So we're saying we're going to take this 140, we're going to times it by 1.04. And at the end of the time frame, we have $145,000 left. Now we're going to inflate that $35,000 that we need to spend by the rate of inflation. Here's the inflation rate that we're using right there. 1.3 is the only thing I could pick offline. And I looked at a bunch of different sites and I had to kind of decipher this, it's not that hard. But anyway, you take 1.3, you divide uh, that by 100 and then you do add it by one. It's, it gives you the number you can use to do a simple mathematic calculation. So all right, we have 35,000, but we got to times that by whatever the inflation rate was, which in this case is 1.3%. So the following year, we need 35,455. Does that make sense? All right, so now what we do the following year, we say we have 140,000, but we have the 140,000, which is minus this right here. So the following year, we're gonna take 140 minus that, which gives us that right there. So we, we have at the beginning of the following year, and this would be 1964, we have $110,000. Why? Because we, the beginning of the other year, we had 140, but we had to subtract out the money we needed for that years of expenditures, which was adjusted for inflation, which left us $110,000. Now the $110,000 also grew this year, happened to be another 1.3% and uh, I'm sorry, 4.19%, which is the yield on the 10 year, which meant we're left with $114,000. And we just keep doing it. We do it every five years, right? So basically about the end of five years, we have essentially hardly anything left in the account. And so now we do it again and we say, okay, here we're gonna take the, so here what we're doing is we're taking this, the year before we had $45,000 left in cash, right? Which got 4.93% yield, but we needed $37,549. So we have about $10,000 difference between how much we had left in cash and how much we needed adjusting for inflation. But that that if we only put ten thousand bucks, it won't be enough for this to live on because we need thirty eight thousand the following year. I hope this all makes sense. I know there's a lot to chomp on, and I'll give you that. I'll, I'll wrap up everything in one final video when we're done here. 
But so we got 45,000 to start the year. It grew at 1.49, uh, 4.93 percent. Uh, we needed 37,549 in cash for that year. So we take 45,000, it was 47,983, subtract that amount. But now we're down to not enough to live on. So we got to take it from stock. So this is year five. And we come over here and we go to the stock market. All right. So now this is 1967 is year five. All right. So again, the S&P 500, we're starting at 1963. It closed at, the, the closing amount doesn't matter. It just, all that matters is the yearly change. And 22.8% in 1963, 16% in 64, 12% in 65 is down 10. So you can see that. So basically, and then, uh, was that 69? Yeah, 69. We had, so we had a couple good years to start, but we had a couple, you know, not so great years towards the end. Either way, uh, higher, or, actually the inflation wasn't bad back then. Yeah, no, inflation was pretty low. It was in the 70s when inflation really started kicking in. All right, but at the end of the day, so we start with 325. We're not touching this because we have the cash bucket taking care of our immediate spending needs. 325 grows by 22%, so it grows to 399. I hope that makes sense. So we got D5 right here. It grew by 1.228%, and that gives us 399 thousand uh, dollars the following year grew by another 16 percent the following year grew by another 12 percent the following year it followed 10 percent so now to 470 now what happens is how much money do we need to pull from this account in order to live for another five years well it's pretty simple we need three years of uh, five years of this amount right here so the amount of money we need to start year five Thirty-seven thousand five hundred forty-nine dollars. We're times in that by five years. All right, so we're saying we need thirty-seven thousand five hundred forty-nine. We don't know what the inflation rate is going to be, so we're just making a speculation that we'll need more or less than that, depending on the interest that we get on our cash accounts, depending on what inflation is. At the end of the day, we say we need thirty-seven thousand five hundred forty-nine dollars. We need it for five years. So we take 37,549, which is this, we times it by five for five years, and then we subtract the difference of these two right here, which is 47,000 minus 37,000. So we don't need 10, we have 10,000 that we're bringing over in order to live on. So we need $177,000. I hope that, I just, I hope that makes sense. But, and we're gonna pull it from the portfolio. Ah, so anyway, so we start the year at $470,000. Now what happens is we start, we say, okay, $470,000 grew by 23.49% in, uh, in whatever year this is, 1967. But we got to pull this amount from that portfolio, 177000 So we start the year at 470. It grew by 20, roughly 24%. But we need to take a distribution of 177000 in order to live off that. All right, so now we're at 470. Grew at 23%. We're taking 177000 out. We're still left with 405. Ah, a lot going on, I know. All right, and I'm not going to explain each and every year, but I'm just, I want you to get a gauge of how this works, all right? So now the same thing happens. We go down, and now we're at year, what's this year, 1972. So let's take a look at inflation in 1972. Still not, it was a high 5.5 and 5.7. It's getting higher for sure. Uh, now in 1972, we are down to 3.2. And the yields, though, which is interesting, the 10-year yield was higher than inflation by a pretty significant amount the whole time, actually until uh, 1974. So the, this is why I wanted to use a, use a strategy because I find it that if we're not giving an interest rate return that was realistic and inflation that was realistic and we're just using average numbers, that, that, that I mean, again, that, I'm just back testing it. And that, but I find that back testing to leave a lot to be desired, if that makes sense. I, I just, I like using the real return someone would have got if they would have done this relative to inflation as well. Because what you're going to see here, in 2000, uh, 1974, our yield is only 7.56, but inflation is at 11. In 2000, uh, 2000, 1975, our yield is 7.99, but inflation is at 9.1. So now inflation is, is, is rearing its ugly head relative to the yields that we're getting, and it's just it's hurting us big time. So what's happening here in the first basically 10 years, our yields are significantly higher than the rate of inflation, which means we're carrying on more uh, for after each five-year cycle. We have more of, uh, of proceeds that we can bring to the next year, but that will change. I'll tell you, it's going to change. It's gonna be, it won't be bad. It's going to be horrific because we're going to run out of money. All right, so now in 2000, I keep saying 2000, 1972, all right, we're getting 6.2% on our bonds. All right, so we start the year, we need... 
46,962 times five. We need five years of 46,962. And this is with real live inflation numbers. And we have a, we have a, actually have a deficit of about $2,700. We only had 44,000 left in the cash buck of the portfolio, but we needed 2,700, uh, we needed 4,700 to $47,000 to spend. So we're going to bring a deficit forward, which means we really, if we did 46,962 times five, we need roughly $235,000. But because we had a, a deficit bringing forward, we need an extra $2,000 from the portfolio. Hope that makes sense. All right. So the portfolio is we have 237,000 from which we get it from the stocks. We get it from the S&P 500. The year before the S&P 500, we had $490,000 in it. We had an 18.98% rate of return, which is great. And we saw 490,000 times 18.98% uh, rate of return minus a 237 that we needed to take out to live for those five extra years left us with a portfolio of $345,000. All right, so we're still good. We're still well above after 10 years where we started. We started with $325,000. We're well above that after 10 years, which is freaking awesome. It's, really, it is. It's fantastic. But it's going to get worse now. All right, so now what happens is we fast forward, fast forward. We keep living. We're, I mean, again, now you start to see inflation at 6, at 11, at 9, at 6, at 6 and a half, at 7. Ugh, now it's going to start getting dicey. So come 1977, all right, so Carter is now in office. Uh, we have 300. Okay, so actually... At the last part of 1976, we needed $665,000 of income to live on at what was the equivalent of $35,000 basically 16 years previous or 15 years previously. So basically our income needs have doubled with the rate of inflation. So we need $65,000 to live on. We times that by five, which means we need $321,000 uh, in total to come from the investment portfolio because we are carrying over about $9,000 in the deposit, which is good. But still, we need $321,000 from the investment portfolio because inflation is rearing its ugly head. So if we go over the investment portfolio, we start, this is where it starts getting a little bit nerve-wracking. So we're what, about 15 years into the cycle. We started the year with $368,000, but we took a tumble that year. We only had we had a down year of 7.18%. 7 and this is where, look, from 73 to 74 to 77, the markets just, they did not, that was a bad five years time frame. It really is bad. This is one of the five-year time frames that does concern me for anybody who's uh, thinking that if you can hold it for the long term, you're going to be okay. I mean, there has been five-year time frames that just wasn't. 2001 and 2 is an example, 73 and 74 uh, was in another example too. So in this case, we're 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 hurting. There's no other way around that. Let me pause for just a second. I thought I heard that. Let's go over the ramifications of what happened if you started investing in 1973. I mean, if you put a hundred thousand dollars in your portfolio, uh, you're down seven uh, 14.66 percent. Then you're down 26.47 percent. Then you're up uh, 37 percent. Which I'm telling you, it sounds great, but the losses are painful. Then you're up. 23%, then you're down 7.18%. So you're sitting on $98,000 after those five years. But yet, if you look at inflation, let's go over to this. So in 1973, you have a 6.2% inflation. So we take $100,000, let's just say we needed $35,000 a year, times 1.062, times 1.11, times... 1.091 times 1.058 times 1.065. That uh, thirty-five thousand dollars now costs fifty, almost fifty-one thousand dollars in income, and yet your portfolio, while it didn't get hammered, is still down in the negative relative to inflation. You before you had a hundred thousand dollars, but you needed thirty-five thousand. So before you had $65,000 surplus, if that makes sense. You're up 65,000 bucks. You had 100,000 and needed 35. Now you have 98,000 and you need $50,000. Let me write this down. 98,000 and you need 50,719. I mean, that's a $48,000 right there. So just the cost of living alone costs you almost $20,000 
um, because the cost of living rose while your inflation, while the uh, stock market didn't do anything, you actually lost a little bit of money. It's tough. All right, so let's keep going back. Because what we're going to see here is now that the market was up, to, we're in year uh, 1976. All right, so we had $368,000, which, which lost money, fell to 92%. So lost, I'll show you what I'm talking about. 368000 minus 7.18% which left us with 341,000, and we have to take 321,000 out of that, which is gonna leave us with uh, a Spartan $20,000 left. That's it. All right, now, the nice thing is that that money we took out will is gonna cover us for the next five years, so it's fantastic. But what happens is we're, we're gonna run out of money here because we, I mean, watch. <laughs> so we're covered for the next five years. I mean, I mean we need 70,000 this year, we need 75,000 next year. We need 84,000. Why is it so bad? Because inflation is again, seven and a half, eight and a half, nine and a half, 11 and a half, 14, 13%. It's tough, man. So basically by the year 1982, uh, we've got no money left. What happens is we have $93,000 in our savings accounts, our cash account. It did grow at 13 point, uh, let's see, the yield on that guy is, Right there, yield it did grow at 13.92 percent. Uh, left us with 93,000, but because inflation that year is 10.3, we needed 105,000 dollars. So we had 105,000 minus 93,000 dollars that we had left in savings, and we come over here to our 32,000 bucks, and we ran out of money. All right, we didn't have enough. I mean, we had just enough recovered the year, and now we're we're broke. We ran out of money in year 20. Now, with that said. We had 20 years of pulling 35,000, the equivalent of 35,000 a year out. Man, that's not so bad in my opinion. I mean, think about it. You retired in 1963. I don't know, when you're 60 years old. You had 80, you have 80 years. You had 20 years of living pretty good money, taking a 7% distribution rate. Um, you know, obviously that's risky, but you were able to get by for 20 years uh, under some serious chaos in the market. So stay tuned. The next one, we're going to show you what happens when we reduce our portfolio by 10% uh, after 10 years. Because again, the idea, and I think it's proven for the most part, is that you spend less as you age. And in fact, you spend significantly less. And I'm going to show you here and uh, you'll get a lot more out of that. All right. So stay tuned. Thanks.